guys, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window. Oh my gosh, Lunar. You are killing it! The stream hadn't even started yet! Already renewing your tier 2 subscription, giving a gift to Mochi. Thank you so much. And hi Mochi, how are you doing? Also, she's almost at a year. She's at 11 months. Next right? year will be a year. That's crazy to think about. It's crazy not only to think, one, that I have been streaming affiliated for a year, but um, that Lunar will be my first, I think, first 12 month person. So congratulations, yeah. Lunar. That's coming up real soon. <laughs> Yes. Also, good morning, Mochi. Yes. Oh my gosh, guys. Okay, so we have another one of our um, live video essay streams for you guys. And we're going to be talking about Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So if you are here for um, our last two, we've done Shadow and Bone like this, and we did the first Harry Potter book like this. And, um, and now we're doing the second Harry Potter book. I hope you guys are excited. Hey, Moisty, how's it going? Love that lurk. We love a good lark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Landon, is there anything you want to say before we just get into it? I was bored. This book is boring. That's all. <laughs> She's going to no. expand on that. I promise she has more comments than just that. <laughs> it's just going to be that for the next two hours, guys. Uh, no, I'm going to wait. I do have something to say, but I'm going to wait until that person is in the chat. Okay. Um, But so that might come at the end. But okay. All right. Well, mystery uh, person, get your booty in here. <laughs> let's get into it. Shall okay. We, shall we dive in? Yes, let's go. Harry Chamber of Potter Secrets. And the Chamber of Secrets. As always, uh, we just want to tell you that this episode of Enter Stage Window will contain spoilers for all of the Harry Potter series and the extended works within the Wizarding Universe, Wizarding World Universe. Uh, we do not live in a bubble where we can pretend we don't know anything that goes on, and we're not going to because some of the stuff that happens now informs some of the stuff that happens later. So if you're like, I haven't read the Harry Potter series and I don't want to know what's going on, this is not the show for you. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you got all the way um, to the year of our Lord 2021 and wanted to read Harry Potter and still haven't. So, you know, that is there's what it is. Actually, I realize I forgot to put on my ears, so I'm fixing that right now. There we there go. There is actually a TikToker. Oh, I should shout her out. I don't know. I don't know her TikTok yet, but who is for the first time, who has no major spoilers and is reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. She's on book six. And I've wow. been book two. And she just like, does minute video updates and stuff like that of, of what her predictions are. And I'm like, it's crazy to think that there are people in the world who don't know that Snape kills Dumbledore. Like, I mean, insane. like, <laughs> at this point, I feel like it's a choice. Like, if you have not read Harry Potter at this point, oh, you yeah. are either a child or you have made a choice. <laughs> you, made, you made a choice, but it still, it blows my mind. And, like, this woman is our age. Like, she's, she's almost Wow! Old. Oh, my and gosh. She's, like, probably in the middle of us. And it's, I was like, wow, they exist. Who knew? <laughs> All right. So, in addition to this not being spoiler-free, um, we're also not going to pretend like Harry Potter isn't a book <gasps> largely, um, that largely features abuse. Whoa, thank you for those biddies there, Lunar. I love that, Hal. Um, we are going to be talking about um, abuse as it relates to Harry and um, as it relates to the racism and bigotry that's symbolized within Harry Potter. Um, so if that makes you uncomfortable, totally understand. You can skip out. You can um, exit stage window. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> we love puns here. Um, That's right. Yeah, and then this is, I mean, this will only continue, but we will dive into some deeper things that we might not even have talked about here. I'm sure that uh, there starts to be a little bit of hints towards transphobia within this book, um, although that is more hinted at later in later books. So we'll start talking about that as well. Yep. Um, and speaking of that. Yeah, we, we like also. Go oh, ahead. Sorry, you go ahead. Go first. I said we would also like to make it clear that we do not here at Enter Stage Window support Joanne Rowling's apparent statements against the trans community. Mm -hmm. We are very much trans allies. I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. What she says and her thoughts are disgusting fuckters. Yeah. Yep. So I don't want to belabor this point, but I just want to say just really quickly um, JKR is a turf. She's a turf. She's a big old turf. She's the biggest turf in the whole wide world. She's a stupid turf. If there was a turf, she's a turf to all the boys and girls. And that's all we're going to say about that because we have a whole episode coming up where we're actually going to talk about JKR herself and some of the evolution of how she herself has uh, grown and changed through this fandom. So we're just going to move on. If you want a longer explanation of that, you can go look at our first Harry Potter um, episode that we did a couple months ago. 
Um, we also here at State Interstage Window encourage viewers to donate to nonprofits organizations, specifically the Trevor Project, which mm -hmm. really helps uh, youths within the trans community find safe homes and have safe uh, resources available to them. So really, if you are going to support the stream or if you were thinking about buying anything from our Amazon wish list or anything like that, please send your money towards uh, the Trevor Project for today's episode. Uh, we try to support it in, with our own money, but we also want to encourage our viewers to look out for nonprofits such as this. Yep. Alrighty. So now that we've had the big things taken care of and all of the like spoiler alerts and all of that taken care of, let's talk about favorite things. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, just to kind of give you give you a, a moment uh, to expand on what you said before about the quality of this book. What was your favorite thing for this book, Lantern? My absolute favorite thing from the book is Tom Felton's version of Malfoy because there's nothing in this book that I liked. I just liked how Tom Felton played Draco Malfoy in the movie version of this book because the book is so goddamn boring. That is it. <laughs> That's it. Also the duel scene. The duel scene is at least entertaining a little bit because we get to see Snape's ass kicked and also we get this line. But other than that, nothing. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, Landon, just serving up, just serving up them, them hot takes. I don't know if it's really hot. I think most people think this book is the worst book, but you know, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But first I want to talk about something I actually liked in the book. And that is the death day party. Now this is cut, of course, from the movie version, but, and it's in the first half of the book, which we'll talk more about as um, the worst half of the book. <laughs> uh, but I think it is a lovely piece of world building. And I love that it comes back at the end as far as um, you know, they've, they've learned during the death day party that the circumstances and day that a ghost died is very important in ghost culture. And then they, at the end it comes back um, where they solve a huge chunk of the mystery by asking Moaning Myrtle about her death and actually taking an interest in her and uh, not just seeing her as a see-through thing, but as a, as a real person, a real ghost person. So I love the death day party. I think it's a uh, it's really charming piece of world building in this book and one of the few things that, uh, that I really enjoy in it. Yeah, I think that, and we'll continue to talk about this, but I think that in like the death day party and the few things that J.K. Rowling does get to world build on this, like the burrow, there is her natural talent of being able to create a world comes out. Um, mm -hmm. So I will agree that like, that's an awesome, like the fact that there are the ghosts exist in themselves without having to be deep characters of understanding, but they exist on the perimeter so that you have like this idea of the headless hunt and um and like just like Sir Nicholas's bitterness about the fact that because he's not truly headless he will never be able to join like that that extended world building that doesn't have anything to do with actual characters and emotions mm -hmm. is fantastic it's where JKR yeah. really shines yeah it's, and it's those little nuggets is those location descriptions it's those like world building pieces we love that and because there are so few, since we've established the world already, uh, there are so few within this novel that 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 world building exists, mm -hmm. uh, and that so the the thing is that the Death Day Party stands out because of that. Yep, for sure. But all right, so we got we got our Draco Malfoy as portrayed by Tom Felton, and we got the Death Day Party. <laughs> he, as, to be fair, he, he is really good in this movie, so I, I understand oh your choice here of, of, I, uh, <laughs> of that. Listen, 12-year-old me, when he ripped out the page in the library book, she was, she, or not the library, the book, the book in the store, she mm -hmm. was just automatically like, oh, this is, this is the type of bad boy that I want, the kind that defiles books. Landon was smitten. <laughs> smitten. So smitten. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So as we have in past episodes, um, we have talked about the, the effect that each of these pieces of media have had on the world at large and at media at large. Um, with the Harry Potter books, it gets a little bit harder and harder because they're not being introduced. They're just adding to the series. However, the second one is what truly launched the Harry Potter books into all of its success. Mm -hmm. Nothing so sells a book like publishing a second book, and Harry Potter proves that in spades. <laughs> so, 
A month after publication of June in June of 1998, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets tops the New York Times bestseller list, only to be dethroned by Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone the next month. Yep. Um, yep. So it, I think it how it was like it was the top for like maybe June and July or um, or something it, like that. And yeah, then, it came yeah. to the top in July. So it, it took a couple weeks to get there. Yeah. Uh, but it came to the top in July. Because, of course, in 1998, there wasn't the, like, marketing that was happening around book series isn't like it was today. No. So, so <laughs> Remember, the Scholastic know, Book Fair was how you did kids' books at that time. Yeah. So people didn't know it had been published. And as soon as they had found out in, in July that it had been published, uh, then people started buying it up a lot. So uh, it had been bought up. It topped the New York Times bestseller. And then starting that August, it was shoved into second place as Sorcerer's Stone takes the top spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and then both books stay on the list, uh, the top 100 list, um, until uh, for 10 years, including all of the books that come after that. So that's the third and the fourth year, fourth. And they stay on that list until New York Times changes their formula 10 years later. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think this uh, is fascinating. So New York Times <laughs> totally changed the way that they did their bestseller list because of Harry Potter, because it was just, they realized that the way that their formula was, Harry Potter was going to be on their list for forever and ever, amen. And the, the truth is, if they were still using that old formula, several of the Harry Potter books would still be on the list. <laughs> so they had to change it. It just, it wasn't right, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you can tell, you can tell that it was because of the formula change. Uh, that the books dropped off because it literally happened overnight. Like it went from being the top in the top 20s to just not even being on the list at all. Uh, <laughs> so it's it was truly like New York Times decided that uh, selling they split the list from they split the list from one bestsellers list to uh, sporadic different lists, including young adults, uh, fiction, nonfiction, all of that. Uh, they separated those lists, and then it has actually nothing to do with how much you sell now. Uh, New York Times bestselling list actually has nothing to do with how many books you sell. It has everything to do with your publication house, uh, and that's what they changed. So yep. as soon as they were like, ah, Harry Potter will be here on here forever, as well as the Bible, we need to change this. They changed it, and Harry Potter fell off, and would only continue to be back on when new books came out. Yep. Yeah, after uh, that 10 year period. Yeah, and those no those new books would be the books that would top those lists. And they would stay at the top for quite a long time. I believe we'll talk I'll get that confirmed, but I think the sixth book stays on the top for like 24 weeks straight. That sounds right. Um we'll we'll double check, of course. We we'll double check all yeah. of these stats when we actually do the episode on that book. But that feels right to me. I want to say like that book, um, that book was very, very popular, the sixth one. Yes. So uh, after the success of this, that both books are suddenly on the New York Times bestseller list, people are getting very, very uh, like passionate about it. Basically, basically, it broke into America. So um, publishing houses over in the UK are not as big, but they and obviously they don't have a, as large a population here in in uh, the USA. So as soon as it broke and made the New York Times bestselling list in America, the the sales were exponential. And that's when the movie rights went for sale. Mm -hmm. uh, so at this point in time, J.K. Rowling actually only had a deal with Penguin Publishing House for four books. Um, she had intended to write seven, but they had signed for four books. And so those four books were bought up, the movie rights were bought up by one, Warner Brothers Studio for $2 million. And man, the best $2 million they ever spent, I bet they, they are just like so thankful because they have made billions off of that $2 million at this well, point. Well, and here's the thing like that with that is that they are probably very thankful, but because of the success of the franchise, uh, the actually it was never disclosed to the public how much the last three books went for, which I'm sure were much more than $2 million. <laughs> God, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they were. They had to have been by that point. Um, um, so yeah, that was a back end, back, uh, you know, a back end deal that they made with Penguin and J.K. Rowling. And um, we don't know how much uh, Penguin sold the rights for the other books. <laughs> no idea. Uh, and even more so than that, what is important is not that $2 million 
uh, dollars, even though what it really did is it took, it took JK Rowling from what she now refers to herself as the modern Cinderella story from being a single mom on welfare to having $2 million in her bank account. Uh, what it really also did was uh, gave her mass control of things that normally authors don't have any control about. J.K. Rowling had opinions and was able to have opinions about casting. She was the one who came up with only British actors were allowed to play uh, the Wizards. She got to make decisions about screenwriting, about what screenwriters she wanted on the deals, and he, and even had a and later in the books even had a screenwriting uh, credit herself. Like there was a lot of control that J.K. Rowling was able to keep because of the mass success. So it wasn't only those two million dollars that she got, but she got those two million dollars and control of her books and a huge percentage of whatever Warner Brothers makes. Yep. And you hear all the time about these types of deals. And I think the famous example is, um, is uh, George Lucas uh, agreeing to to have the toy rights for Star Wars. And then he that's where he really made all of his money. And, uh, and J.K. Rowling makes one of the uh, best financial decisions of her life by deciding she wants to maintain creative control uh, over this franchise so that she can oversee it. And um, and that makes that sets her up so that she can continue to milk Harry Potter until it is absolutely dry and brittle. Um, and and now she is very, very wealthy because of that. She is and will and continues to be. She can. Yeah, she, getting, she can't ever be poor again. It's impossible at this point. No, it is literally like even if like, yeah, with with the like she gets a profit cut from Universal Studios, like mm -hmm. the parks, the theme parks, not the uh, company, but it is ridiculous. So mm -hmm. she can never be poor again. It really did take her from what she views as nothing to a, to one of the richest women in the world, right? Yep. This, yep. this is the, this is the starting. It was Sorcerer, it was not Sorcerer Stone that started it. It was Chamber of Secrets that really started and projected her success to the lengths that it could be. Yep. So Let's get into the Chamber of Secrets, shall we? Yes. So we have a summary here. We we realize we mess we messed up on the first Harry Potter episode um, by not really summarizing the plot, and so it kind of we didn't scaffold our information correctly. So Landon has a a lovely summary of the book for us. So she's going to summarize the plot really quickly for those of us that um it's been a while because I'm sure for some of you guys it's been a while because again this is the most boring book. Um, I typically skip it in my rereads, although I did reread it of course for this episode. Um, but yeah, so so take it away, Landon. Tell us the the short version of the story of Chamber of Secrets. I would like to let you know that the short version is still long because so much <laughs> shit happens in this book and we'll talk about why. But after his adventurous year at Hogwarts, Harry returns back to his aunt and uncle's house to find that he is being plotted against before his second year can even start. Someone, specifically a house elf named Dobby, believes Harry is facing more danger than he ever did before. And after an escape from the Dursleys via flying car and a quick stay at Ron's family's house, the burrow, Harry returns to Hogwarts where the danger makes itself known. Between Ron's little sister's crush, his rivals, Draco Malfoy's obsession, first year Colin Creevy's stalking tendencies, and Professor Lockhart's habit of using him for fame, the last thing Harry wants is to hear voices that no one else can hear. But things start to go even worse as muggle-born students are suddenly beginning to be petrified, along with the looming threat that the Chamber of Secrets has been opened and the heir of Slytherin has come to rid the schools with those of impure blood. The whole school is convinced that Harry, it is Harry when it is, when it is revealed that he can talk to snakes, but Harry is convinced that it's his arch enemy Draco Malfoy has something, to do, has something to do with it. So brewing a highly illegal and complicated potion until Harry discovers the diet, or in, sorry, but brewing a highly illegal and complicated potion is of course the next step in order to catch him. But even that results in nothing. It isn't until Harry discovers a diary once belonging to Tom Riddle that takes him through the memories of the past where he learns that 50 years ago, Hagrid was expelled for keeping a monster that was attacking students the very same way. It is then revealed that Hermione has fallen victim to the heir's attacks. Trying to seek answers they save their friend, uh, to save their friend, they watch Hagrid as he is arrested uh, and sent to Azkaban with no trial. His last piece of advice is to walk into the Forbidden Forest, which, by the way, bad shit happened the year previously there, 
and find the answers in there. The only answers we get from this is that the giant spiders are just as freaked out of whatever is looming in the castles as we are. The visit uh, of their, they visit their fallen friend uh, who has been petrified because in true Hermione fashion, she has already figured it out that it is a giant snake using the pipes to get around. No wonder, um, no wonder Harry is the only person who can hear it. And no wonder that no one notices the hissing noises reverberating through the castle. Uh, but it's too late. Ginny Weasley is taken from the monster's lair and the school is closing. Ron, Harry, and the reluctant help of Professor Lockhart journey down to the Chamber of Secrets in horror. Uh, Harry pulls a sword from the hat, nearly dies, and destroys the diary that houses the piece of Riddle's soul. Everyone escapes without any damage except for Lockhart, who, due to a backfired memory charm, cannot remember anything about himself. The world is saved, Lucius Malfoy is furious, and Harry returns back to his abusive aunt and uncle's house, surely about to have a worse summer than the previous one. And that is what happens Chamber in the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. let me tell you, that is all the important stuff. There is so much other fluff stuff. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for the applause, Mochi. Yes, wonderful job reading that to us, um, Landon. I really, really appreciate um, your work on that because I had no idea how to summarize this book, um, I... but Landon took that on and uh, and and with something that I don't know what else you would cut. No, that's pretty much everything that happens. <laughs> I was like, I was typing it out and I was like, this is all necessary for today. Like, I can't leave out anything that we're talking about today, but it is so long and this is cutting <laughs> out so much. Shit. <laughs> well, you deserve every bit of that applause. Thank um, you. So I'll yes. In addition to the plot summary, um, I want to say also that this is the other kind of like very children's lit book, and they really do act like children. So as you were um, as you were giving that summary, uh, it just cracks me up once again. Some twelve year olds thinking other twelve year olds are murderers. Like what's a more twelve year old thing than to think your classmates are capable of murder? Like they they, they have such like child minds in this book, and um, it it amuses me so much. Yeah, but <laughs> like there and there is a lot here that is 12 year old thought process as characters but also uh directed towards children like the fact that they can do this highly illegal very complicated potion as second years when we later learn that they learn it as seventh years like the idea that they can do that is so like oh it's no problem it's kind of like the sorcerer's stone is being guarded by all of these things that 12 that 11 year olds can figure out right well it, i mean it, <laughs> luckily they have hermione so i mean oh, plot yeah. plot device duh it works <laughs> out <laughs> and then jk rowling was like how do we get rid of hermione because hermione would have already solved this that's right we'll petrify her bitches perfect um, i mean honestly like out of out of all of the things that i complain about with uh, certain character choices and stuff honestly same i would have written it the same way with these characters i would have taken hermione out halfway through too <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's vitally important to talk about the fact that this is still children's literature yes. there's still a mysterium element there is still a mystery formula that is happening uh there are hints to like almost like the fact that harry is trying to solve something and it's mm -hmm. one mystery that is being solved overall. That is the mystery series, the child lit element to all of this that is still holding on strong, even though I think in this one more so than the than the third or than the first one, you can tell JKR is trying to push away from it. Yeah, it's like she um, wants to push away, but she kind of can't. And she gets a little bit more freedom in the third book to push away yeah. from that. So we, we grow up a little bit in the third book. And then, of course, in the fourth book, it becomes full on YA and not children's YA. lit anymore. But this one is still definitely has a firm footing in children's lit. And you can and you can tell you can also tell by the amount of stuff that happens. Like it is like the fact that the Dursleys, which so much stuff happens in the Dursleys, as far as abuse goes, as far as things that are important to Harry, as far as like talking and conversations and different things, all happen in the first 30 pages. Mm -hmm. It, it moves is very boom, fast. Boom, boom, boom. Like you never in a book, you never want your readers to be bored, but there's never any time contemplating or spent like reflecting on what has just happened mm -hmm. it goes from one thing to the next and this speed is what also really reflects children's lit yep so never never does harry turn to one of his friends and go wow that was insane can we talk about that you know <laughs> which, which in later books that that speed never really slows down because it's still ya but it certainly gets better and the pacing gets better in later books whereas with this it's like bam 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 
Mm-hmm. And then spiders, and then this, and then that, and then bloody yep. footprints, yep. and all, and not bloody footprints, but bloody messages on the wall, and all of these things are constantly happening. And it is exhausting to read. I can't imagine being Harry. It must be exhausting to live his life. <laughs> <laughs> poor kid. Good thing he's fictional. Poor, poor kid. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I think that there, like, this idea that there's this overarching, like, uh, like, journey and mystery to solve it still really proves that this is this is children's lit and we have to come at it from this point of view yep so let's and of course children acting like children which is fun because you really do lose that in the later books this is i think the last book where children are actually acting like children yeah they really act their age in this book and there's some parts in other books where that's not really the case oh fifth fifth book i'm looking at you (laughs) Um, (laughs) Woo! yes let's Let's move on to our first thing that we want to deep deep dive, and that is the Weasley family. Oh my gosh. I uh, absolutely love when they go to the borough, and it just shows once again the the talent on display here when it comes to the way Rowling describes locations. It's just beautiful. You read about the bro and you're like, oh my God, like I want to be friends with the Weasleys. I want to go hang out at their house. I want to see the fancy clock. Like I want to, you know, I want to um, have Molly's cooking. Like it's just like, it's the way that it's described is so compelling. You just can't help but feel like you want to experience it. Yeah, I wish we got to see, I wish we got to see more wizarding homes throughout the series. Because the way that the borough is described is so unique. And then you're told in by like context as far as like Ron's family being poor and unable to afford things. And that's why it kind of looks like a shack that's breaking down constantly. Uh, that this isn't as grandiose and as splendid as magic can make something. So it, I, it fascinates me. And it's something that I, I always am really sad about that we don't get to see is the different sorts of places and homes and wizarding families uh within the universe because i think that she does a great job with the borough i would love to see how she did it with other places yeah well because it's from harry's perspective i think in a in in other in other situations we might get to see some of that um but yes i totally agree i would have loved to somehow structure the book in such a way that like we could get an early peek into draco's home or something like that you know what i mean Absolutely. And I understand, like, obviously, it's not something that I'm saying that should have happened. It's just that she does write these places so well, that being able to explore more of these places is something I always wanted. Yep. Um, So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the Weasleys themselves, though. Um, From Harry's perspective, of course, he has lived all of his life with the Dursleys as the black sheep of their family, experiencing um, relatively extreme uh, abuse from from his oh yeah absolutely from from like his aunt and uncle from dudley um you know it, it's implied that he's experienced a lot of abuse from his classmates although that's blamed on dudley etc cetera, etc cetera. you get the idea right so he goes to the weasleys and he sees this family that's like kind of sort of normal and he the way that i read it it's like he glorifies it it's like he sees them and he's like oh my god it's this perfect family it's not a perfect family when you reread this as an adult it is very clear this is not a perfect family there's lots of problems going on here but from harry's perspective this is like the best thing since sliced bread like these are the coolest people in the world the nicest people in the world and just like the best he could ever hope for and like reading this now as an adult it's so sad right because when i read it to me this is like a normal um as far as like level of dysfunction family like they are far from perfect all of them have issues and the way that they interact with each other is a lot of times not very cool (laughs) but from harry's perspective they're amazing and this is something of course that i never picked up on as a kid you know what i mean yeah i think that like that's also part of the i don't want to call it problematic because it's not necessarily problematic But that is the difficult part about this is that when you are reading it and on first glance and you're not trying to dig any deeper because we're reading it from Harry's perspective, we're we're basically being told that this is the perfect family, that there is nothing wrong with this family, that this is what everyone should strive to be. And it's like, it's it's not great. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of issues there, uh, Joanne. (laughs) 
Um, well, I, I don't know. This might be one of the ones where she knows, but Harry doesn't know. It's hard to tell. And and we don't know. Obviously, yeah. we're not psychic. But like, I'll, I, I'll give it. I'll give an example of it. Like when they first come in on the on the flying car, and like the way that Molly freaks out about it, it's it's a very normal reaction, but it's not the best reaction. Or, <laughs> you know what I mean? The howler, like the howler yeah. in general, like humiliating your child in front of everybody. Yeah, that's great. Um, probably not a good parenting technique. And no. again, it's not like they're terribly, horribly abusive people. They're not. Um, they are obviously a, a normal level of dysfunction. But I don't know, a part of me, a part of me says because none of that is ever brought to light. Harry continues to believe that this is the most perfect family that ever exists throughout the novels. Uh, a part of me is like, I don't know. Um, but that's just something that like when you read, it's like, okay, there is there is a lot of issues here. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, um, and it, it kind of comes up, it kind of comes up as like, uh, you get this family dynamic, where it's a very like sitcom family dynamic, right? Like the mom is a little bit too overbearing, and the dad is a little bit too checked out. And um, from from Mr. Weasley's perspective, it's because he's very interested in his work, his work and his hobby are the same thing. So he's kind of like obsessed with it a little bit, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. so like, he's, you know, his reaction to the flying car is, oh, well, how did it how did it drive? Like, you know, was it did it go good? Good? you know tell me about it and uh, molly's like the fuck sir <laughs> our children could have killed themselves <laughs> you and know and it's it's a very it's a very sitcom in that way oh yeah, thank you so lunar i do need a posture check <laughs> and so checked out also that like not recognizing your own kid and being like okay and i know this is more movie than it was book but it i felt it was very accurate to the character where it was like ah which one are you again like to harry not even realizing that not his own child, right? Yes. <laughs> like, good ad good ad lib there because um I think Arthur would say that. Oh, that I, hydrates for you, Landon. Oh, thank you. I'm very thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, so their their family dynamic is is very to me. It's very like '90s sitcom, like yeah. um, and and all and and all of the problems that come along with that, right? So it's it's very like uh, each each of the kids has their own like character flaw in them, and all the character flaws mixed together in this very dramatic way uh, in the family. Yeah, and I think that we we specifically see the like toxic family dynamic uh, play out most. I'm not. I don't even think it's in this book. I think we see it a lot with Ginny, and we will dig into that in a second. Yeah. But also yep. later in books, when we start learning more about Ron and his deep insecurity and his like not feeling good enough and his like they I'm literally a child that was in the way between my mom having a girl. Mm -hmm. That my mom wanted a girl so bad that she just having she just had kids until she had a girl. Yeah, and I think Ron but, feels that the the hardest out of all of the kids. And I think it's not it's obvious. Like mm -hmm. I I don't think it's like even even hidden. Like Mrs. Weasley, the way she dotes on Ginny and wants Ginny to be a girl, and and this will continue throughout the rest of the book series is a lot. Yeah. It really uh, is. And and poor Ron feels it the most because like it's kind of like Fred and George, right? They get to they get to have each other, you know, so they can kind of bond with each other and it's okay, you know, how their parents treat them. They've got their coping mechanisms with their twin thing, right? And then you got the the older boys. Um, they were born so early, they're just not really feeling it in the same way that Ron does. They they probably had a, a very different childhood experience because there wasn't like a gajillion kids around, you know? Yeah. So they then, probably got more attention from their parents. But then by the time Ron comes along, like they've had so many kids at this point. Yeah. That, so uh, poor like, Ron feels all that. Well, and it's also very interesting. And, and this again happens in the fifth book uh, when Ron is made prefect, that it's also explained that like, Bill was head boy. Charlie was captain of the Quidditch team. Uh, Percy becomes head boy later. Uh, George and George and Fred open their own, like they're very different, but they have each other and their own thing. And then Ron, and then there's Ron, Ron, who's never been particularly the best at Quidditch, who isn't head boy material, who, who very much is kind of like uh, just very different, but very alone. And then there's Ginny who can do no wrong. Except yeah. for when she does do wrong, and then it's all her fault because you know. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want us to touch a little bit more on Mr. Weasley before we move to Ginny, but yes. just really, really quick, like 
the way that um the way that mr weasley dotes on muggle things it's portrayed as like very cute but kind of like looking at it as an adult if you really think about how that would manifest in in this world it's uh it's almost like fetishizing it's almost like i want somebody to say like um mr weasley like i love that you're so excited but I just think you need to take a deep breath a little bit and maybe um, not be so intense about it, asking these questions. Because I, I just feel like I could easily see how if Mr. Weasley was having these conversations with an adult as opposed to a child, that the adult would be a little bit offended. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> he does, right? When he meets, when he meets um, Hermione and Hermione's parents, he like just will not stop hounding them him like it's implied in a couple lines but about dentistry and rubber ducks mm -hmm, and all of mm -hmm. these things like it, it is very fetishizing and it is very much like there's also this hint that he's not learning like so he's just asking questions and fascinated with the answer and then not using the higher order thinking of being like okay why does this matter right mm -hmm. it's just kind of like oh a rubber duck floats my goodness why would they want that? Like that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, yep. And it's, it's kind of gross. It's it's not cute. <laughs> yep. And and because we get the books from Harry's perspective, there's never an opportunity for somebody, for us to see somebody pulling Mr. Weasley aside and being like, sir, please stop. <laughs> you are human. Also, the idea that they don't have these things in the, in the wizarding world still blows my mind. Like, yeah, like why wouldn't like, they have rubber ducks? I mean, like they're just a I, toy. Yeah. <laughs> and I understand, like, this is, he's obviously a pure, he's a, the Weasleys are a pure blood family, so there's a lot of, like, not known about muggles, although they're not, like, his grandparents and, or his parents and Molly's parents were never, like, actively part of the Death Eaters. So the idea that they haven't met, like, half-bloods or have any half-blood friends or have anything, like, to enter into their world that they're all purely magic is just kind of shocking. But it's yeah, I, I it almost makes it makes me wonder, like, what was Arthur's childhood like that he was brought up in such a way that he never experienced these things until adulthood? Because it's very obvious he never experienced these things until adulthood with the way that he talks and acts. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's just it's just one of those things where it's yep. like, OK, this is not this is kind of gross. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the, the main Weasley that we have. Um, yes. Ginny. So Ginny. Ginny is vitally important to this book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because she is one of the most important characters. She ends up being the person who was possessed within the book, uh, who, who did Tom Riddle's, who did Tom Riddle's uh, bidding, whether she knew it or not, uh, mm -hmm. who nearly died, who nearly resurrected Voldemort, mm -hmm. all of these things. And the only thing we know about her is that she's lonely and she has a crush on Harry. Yeah. Oh, so, and she's the girl that Mrs. Weasley always wanted. Those are the right. three things we know. Uh, <laughs> And it's it's one of those things like um like because this is the only character trait that we get for her like it's very plot driven right which is also a, a you know uh, something that happens in children's yeah. lit right so it's this is a very plot driven decision about her character like oh she's not girly enough for her mom and she has all of these male siblings and so she grows up very lonely so she becomes attached to this evil diary and da 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 da, -da and all of these things like it, it makes a lot of sense right. Um, but I think it is, it's really sad that at no point do we get an opportunity for Jenny and Harry to have a conversation. And maybe, and this is partly me, like I, I do this, I do this a lot when I'm reading because I started out a lot of my writing role playing. And what do you do in role play? You make characters talk to each other. That's like 99% of what you do, right? Sometimes we write action scenes and, and like saucy things, right? But mostly it's making characters talk to each other. So when I read a book and I'm like, wait, these two characters like literally never talk to each other. It is like, a beacon to me like I notice it instantly so in this book Jenny being a pivotal plot character and never once having like a real conversation with Harry is just kind of like such a huge missed opportunity to me that um I'm like I would have never let that happen if I was writing this you know what I mean I 100% agree with you I think part of the problem is that JK Rowling made it a pivotal part of her character to not be able to talk around Harry because yeah. her crush was so large. She didn't see Harry as a human, right? She didn't see him as another person. She saw him as like something to have a crush on. Um, and because of that, she never was able to talk around Harry. Yeah. 
Uh, and we know, of course, Harry's a bad friend, so Harry never approaches her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and also, I mean, a part of me sits there and goes, why would he? He's his little, his best friend's little sister. Like, he doesn't know how to interact with other human beings. Why would he yep. approach Jenny? Mm -hmm. um but I think that it's that was a mistake right that was part that was something that was injustice to Ginny's character that we are supposed to care about Ginny like she's she's there's a big huge reveal where like her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever and we discover that it's Ginny Weasley and as readers and as readers I I could not care less (laughs) it's like so it it wasn't a character I cared about Mm -hmm. It wasn't a character that I was like, oh man, this character is really vitally important. And, and I, and she was so cute and she had that cool conversation, like all the things we learn about her that makes her interesting. We learn about her after, uh, like the idea that she was wrapped up in this, in this whole, uh, diary thing. We learn about that after we don't have any feeling towards her other than the fact that she wrote Harry a love song. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's, that's it and he it. didn't even like it he didn't even like it <laughs> or like he, ask he her about it, it. Yeah, he, yeah he didn't ask her about it afterwards he didn't even like it and so it's like it's it's very hard to care in that moment when it's Ginny like you know it makes as as a reader you want it to be like oh you want it to be like Hermione or Draco or I don't know there's a whole bunch of other characters that or we have, have a little bit more on Ginny Weasley. <laughs> yeah or have developed Ginny so that we care like hell I you would have you would have more feeling for Neville being down there and he's not that developed yet at this point you know what I mean like it's just Ginny gets so little that it's just like why like she's down there and like it's like why like we know why but you don't feel it yep and the most I think the thing that also makes me very uh, passionate and infuriated by the lack of development of her in this book is the fact that we get so much development for her later when it is in terms that Harry finds her attractive. When Harry wants to start dating her, we start seeing actually parts of Ginny Weasley. Mm -hmm. And it Uh, always feels sexist to me because every other Weasley boy (laughs) gets more development than Ginny. And a lot of them are are less important to the plot of any of the books. And yet we know more about every single one of Ron's brothers than we know about Ginny at the point that they find her in the Chamber of Secrets. Now, by the end of the book, you know as much about Ginny as some of the brothers, right? But not at the moment that we're supposed to care about her. And even then, you would know about this one thing. You know Mm -hmm. about the fact that she was lonely she found a diary in her stuff. She started writing to the diary. The diary possessed her. Like, that's all you really know about her. Yeah. Um, you don't You don't really start, you don't see the effect that that has on her. You don't see anything until around the fifth book. And that's when she starts getting a boyfriend. That's when we are introduced to Luna Lovegood through her. Um, that's when, she, and that's when Harry kind of, even though he hasn't acknowledges it and doesn't acknowledge it until the sixth book, that's when Harry starts finding her kind of worthy of liking her. Yep. Because uh, he starts to think, oh, maybe she's kind of cute, you know. <laughs> he starts being interested in girls. He starts being interested in Cho Chang at that point. So, like, girls suddenly turn on his radar. So he's suddenly aware of all of the girls in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I agree with you that there is a lot of, I don't think J.K. Rowling knows how to write girl characters. Because even then, at this point, I think Hermione is severely underdeveloped compared to Ron and Harry. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that, which is also interesting because I don't think she knows how to write male characters. Uh, but I think that the the female characters are more of a conscious, she doesn't believe she can write them. And male characters, she's like, it's easier. And then there's a lot of, you know, problems because it's interesting how her take on teenage boys. But we'll get yeah, to that is, next book. Yeah, next book that comes up. But it, it is funny because um, <laughs> Hermione book. got most of her development in the movies. Yeah. And that's true. And you can even find like lots of interviews where um, where J.K. Rowling is with the director of the movies who Hermione was the director's favorite character. Like he loved Hermione. So, of course, he put a lot of work into her in the movie. And um, you can find interviews with the two of them talking about that and things that J.K. Rowling laments um, that he kind of like uh, fixed and helped Hermione with. <laughs> well, and also Emma, Emma Watson. Emma mm-hmm. Watson was a huge part of the development of Hermione. Yes. She put in a lot of work. She put in a lot of work. She also was not afraid of very much like Hermione to sit there and say, no, I think Hermione would do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm going to play Hermione this way. Like she wasn't afraid to do that. Uh, Whereas, whereas there are some parts where, where Joanne 
treats Hermione as a as a thing, like lighting like lighting Snape's robes on fire. The previous book, um, she didn't understand the implications of that to the character because mm-hmm. uh, she would also argue like that Hermione isn't, you know, isn't she's very passive or whatever. And it's like no, Hermione literally wrote a literally set fire to a teacher's robes. <laughs> like that's the opposite of passive. <laughs> uh huh. I mean, she's the one that comes up with this potion plan. Like she does, she does so many things. Um, so, it's it's just so it's it's just so interesting to me that in the book, out of Harry's friends, you know, Ron and Hermione, Ron is clearly the better character, and then in the movies, it's quite the opposite, where Ron is really done dirty, and Hermione's the better character. Yes. Yeah. There's no version uh, where they both get to shine. But anyway, back to Jenny. <laughs> Jenny yes. Jenny is. I mean, she's so underdeveloped. We can't even stay on subject with her. Like, I know, that's right? That's just basically what we're saying. And, and we want to care about her. Like as a reader, I wanted to care about her because I knew how important she becomes to the series. But if I was reading this book for the first time, I would be honest. I'd be like, I don't, what? Yeah. <laughs> and the, and the thing is the fandom does take care of her. Fandom Jenny is so much better than canon Jenny. Like this is fandom, one of the characters that the fandom like really takes and, and loves. Fandom most people are better than canon most people. True. <laughs> but Jenny's a really good early example. Yes. Um, I'm like and trying then, to think, I'm like, who's the most like, whose fandom is the most like their canon? And I think that's uh, Probably Fred Luna. George. And Luna. Uh, Luna and Fred and George, I think, are all yeah. great characters that are actually written and they're really just there for comedy purposes. Yeah. And then in fandom, they're pretty much the same. Oh, all right. Okay. That's my fault. Uh, anyway, and then and then we get into the fun the fun thing that happens to every young woman uh, at any age, mm-hmm. and that's the victim blaming. <laughs> yeah, that's yep. the classic victim blaming. Which is, you know, Molly again having like way too hard of a reaction on Jenny when she's caught and found out that she's the one that caused all of these problems and that she messed with the diary she shouldn't have messed with. And I mean, Molly doesn't give her a second; like she's just like, you know, honor bad. How just like she ever, was to the boys yeah yeah how can you ever trust something where you don't see where it keeps its mind like she's yeah a like she's supposed to know it's <laughs> like what it's a book <laughs> it's a book that she thought you bought her like what um and, and i think i mean i also think that speaks to mrs weasley's inherent even though she desperately wanted a girl mrs weasley doesn't like girls she doesn't like Hermione. She doesn't like Fleur when we meet Fleur. She doesn't like who Ginny becomes. Mm-hmm. Like, there is no female character that Mrs. Weasley actually likes. Yeah. It's almost like Mrs. Weasley has this girl construct in her mind that mm-hmm. she expects women to be. And then um, when they're not, she is disappointed. You know? Huh. Huh. I wonder who we remind, who that <laughs> reminds us of. Anyway. <sighs> Uh, but yeah I think that the, and I think what is truly a shame is that this experience because because Ginny is so underdeveloped at least this is my experience with with uh Ginny in in canon because Ginny is so inexperienced this early on or not inexperienced underdeveloped when we experience her later this is forgotten right like there is a line in the sixth book where Ginny goes like you could have talked to me about being possessed after all I'm the only other person who's been possessed by Voldemort and like Harry forgot but we as (laughs) readers also forgot Mm -hmm. because Ginny is so underdeveloped in this book that she like this thing just happens we don't keep this in mind for her character until she literally has to say it yeah. Uh, and I think that that just does her a disservice because it's fascinating. It should be a part of her character and not something that needs to be constantly reminded because we didn't care enough when we first were introduced to her. Yep. Um, but I think from Harry's perspective, it's kind of like, you know, Ginny is this little girl, you know, she's Ron's younger sister, right? And she has this annoying crush on him. And that is a huge part of this book is um, is the unwanted attention that uh, that Harry experiences and Jenny is a really good example of that but there's others as well like there this this book are. is basically Harry's introduction yeah <laughs> this book is basically Harry's introduction to what being famous is like and he don't like it he do not like it 
Um, I think that there is there is a large list here, um, and we're going to go through just very quickly and remind us all here. But I think that what is vitally important is that we get the first introduction to a character that will change the Harry Potter se series for the rest of the series, and it will play a major part in every single book, and that is the press. This is the first yep. time that we get introduced to the press as someone who is taking an interest in Harry. And we're introduced that we're introduced to that concept through Gilderoy Lockhart and his love mm -hmm. of the press. Uh, but this also starts where Harry's hatred of the press starts. So that I is love this picture. Of... I, I love this cast picture that you found that's got like, um, you know, uh, Daniel Radcliffe and whoever it was that that played um, Lockhart. I can't remember his name, but yeah. And Harry's like looking at him like the fuck get your hand off me. <laughs> Yeah, it was like I was like I saw that I was like that's what I perfect mean. yes but yeah it's it's um, it's all throughout this book like that's part of why this book I think is sometimes a struggle for me as far as finding it boring because it's like all theming no substance like all these things are happening and the things don't connect in a way that you realize until until the end and it just doesn't it doesn't have that like. Mm, good ver verisimilitude that some of the other books have when they end and wrap everything up, you know, so it's kind of just like theming, 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 theming. So here's, here's, this is one of the themes is how Harry reacts to fame and, and, and tension that he's not interested in. So there's Ginny's crush. Draco is incredibly obsessed with him and shows it over and over and over in this book. My favorite thing was that Karen texted me. She's like, this is the dreary book. And I'm like, I know for a fact this is not the dreary book. We yeah, but you're thinking of it from Harry's perspective. Out. No. And then I re I was rereading this. I was like, oh, maybe this is the dreary book. Because so, because I was taking it, I was taking it from Draco's yes. perspective, right? And I think you're talking about the, the book oh, where, yeah. um, the later book, was it Sixer? Whatever the one is. Anyway, yeah, it's in Harry's like constantly thinking about Draco. But I was taking it from Draco's perspective. For, for Draco, this is where the obsession starts. Like, even as early as like just talking about like, my favorite is talking about Harry to his dad. And we know from the things that Lucius Malfoy are saying, that's been like, you've told me this before, that it is August or July and, and Draco has not shut up about Harry. Yes. The entire month of June, the entire month of July and whatever bit of August that, that has happened. That Lulu is, is so, oh my, Lulu is so tired of hearing about Harry. He is so tired of hearing about Harry. I think like if he didn't hear Harry's name for a week, he would be like, bless thank god <laughs> thank god also something's wrong with draco he disappeared he's <laughs> not here to talk about harry uh i mean this is yeah. the age this is probably the age where he's, where he's wondering maybe my child is like gay for harry oh no 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> malvoy would never accept such things draco could be straight but here's the thing draco is not straight how do we know because no other 12 year old boy talks about another 12 year old boy as much as draco talks about harry uh, only in fiction <laughs> only in fiction right only in fiction <laughs> <laughs> and only if you're trying really hard not to make your characters clear <sighs> and oh my be God. denial about it. Um, but he's so obsessed. He's so obsessed. He's but it's so not just obsessed. him. It's not no. just him, right? There, This is intentional theming in the book. Like, that's the, the Draco thing. Like, maybe that's accidental. We don't know. But there's stuff in here that's obviously intentional, right? So Colin Creevy is constantly stalking him. It's like four or five times in the book that Harry has to tell Colin Creevy to fuck off. And that's, I mean, it's like, over he, and over. And that's when he starts tell, telling Colin to fuck off. Like, I think yeah. there's twice before he's even like, please don't take my picture. That yeah. Colin just straight up takes his picture like rude it's, it's, yeah I mean it is it is I think Colin Creevy will represent the press uh he will fall back as the press takes a bigger yep. thing but again it is that idea of theming Colin yes. Creevy is uh, constantly there taking pictures of Harry in, in situations that Harry doesn't want pictures being taken here like when he loses his arm like when he loses his arm bone by the way that wasn't in my uh that wasn't in my summary but things like that happened anyway <laughs> Uh, when he loses his arm bone, Colin Creevy's like, oh, let me take a picture. And Harry's like, I'm in pain. I've just literally lost the bone to my arm. Please don't. Yeah. Uh, and then another one, which is seen as, uh, is less invasive. Like Harry doesn't get as angry about it um, externally as he does with Draco Malfoy and Colin Creevy and Ginny, but is still infuriated by it. And that's Dobby's interference in mm -hmm. Harry's life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is... you can tell that he's mad because at one point in, in oh, the yeah. hospital, like he just like yells at Dobby 
And, um, and he yells knowing that Dobby is abused. And it's very obvious that Harry doesn't want to yell at him, but he is at his wits end and can't help himself. Yeah, no, he is, he is pissed and like tells basically Dobby to fuck off. Uh, but he's, but it's not like the same like level of call and go away. It's just like, okay, Dobby, don't hurt yourself, uh, but I'm going <laughs> to yell at you. Um, but, and Dobby is doing it for, I think a different reason than everybody else so far. Ginny has done it because he has, she has a crush. Colin Creevy also has a crush. Draco Malfoy also has a crush. Uh, <laughs> but Dobby, they, all, they all have various levels of crush. <laughs> they all have various, various levels. Um, but Dobby is doing it because he genuinely thinks Harry's going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what makes him different and what also makes him this level of interference because Dobby's interference never stops. Uh, whether we, as the right, yeah, whether we as the readers acknowledge it or not, it never stops. This level of interference continue throughout the book and Harry get to the place where he is okay with it because yeah. Dobby is genuinely trying to save Harry's life. Um, even if he's going about it the completely wrong way. <laughs> yeah, he's trying his hardest. But he's imagine like, from Dobby's perspective, hearing Draco go on and on and on and on and on about this kid named Harry. Like, I can imagine how Dobby, um, in his mind, conjures this version of Harry that's like, oh, the, the potentially perfect wizard that if he just grows up right and stays safe, then he's going to save everybody and the world's going to be better. Like, I can totally see from Dobby's perspective um, how that manifests in his mind, hearing the things that Draco, I'm sure, says about Harry over the summer. I never, it never occurred to me that Dobby's obsession with Harry is because Draco has just been bitching about his middle school crush. <laughs> yeah, like he's, and he, like, okay, so this is in my mind, like, I don't know, but this is in my mind how it happens. So Draco's like bitching, 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 right? And Lulu's like, I'm so tired of this. I'm getting rid of everything. Here's the diary, right? Because that's, you know, he starts that oh, yeah. whole gravy train, right? So, so Lucius is like, okay, here we go. Here's the diary released into the school. We're going to clean this, this mess up. And Dobby's like, oh no, my perfect savior, Harry. Uh, he's gonna get hurt. I have to go help. Like this whole family is literally like doesn't do anything but fuck around with Harry. <laughs> yes. I mean, at least with Draco, it's understandable. Lucius is a grown ass man. Please stop, Lucius. Please stop. Lucius just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Lucius. I have so many feelings about Lucius, but. Mm -hmm. He's I love Lulu, so awesome. by the way, for, for y'all that don't know. Terrible he's, father. Terrible I mean, person. You, it's but fun. you know, you know, some of my favorite characters in this book are some of the adult Death Eaters. I think they're fascinating characters. Um, wonderful in Fanon. Um, you know, I, I love that that dark shit. I mean, y'all that were here for um, the Thursday stream, you remember my writing style, I got the gray storm. So, I, I mean, that. you get it. <laughs> I yeah I there's a lot but I I love my villains like Lulu mm -hmm. hits a little close to home in some ways but yeah understood and then the last and the most annoying unwanted attention in Harry's mind at least in this particular book is Gilderoy fucking Lockhart yeah <laughs> uh and that is skeevy I I don't think I realized how skeevy Gilderoy was because I always thought he was like a stupid character but he's really skeevy and gross to know that he is taking advantage of a 12 year old boy's fame mm -hmm. for his own ego stroke yeah uh, is is real gross yep, uh, yep. gross character <laughs> yep, um, yep. and and Harry doesn't want it for a second Harry sees exactly what it is and is like please stop I'm going leave me alone and then Gilderoy doesn't yeah, I think that's the thing, though. And this is also a very like, you know, kids acting like kids. I think it's a very 12 year old reaction to like just know something is wrong and want to get away from it and yeah. not be able to like articulate exactly what's wrong or why it feels wrong. And that is exactly how Harry reacts to Lockhart. The way that Harry reacts to Lockhart reminds me so much of kids that are just like, I don't want to be left alone with this specific adult. And then you find out later it's because this specific adult has some weird shit going on. You know, that's exactly what happens here. Yep. So it is, it is that, but shall we take a deep dive into Gilderoy Lockhart? 
Yes, let's talk about him. Let's talk about him. So I have to say before we get too far into him that out of all of the various red herring Defense Against the Dark Art whatever teachers um, that we get in the books, Gilderoy is definitely my least favorite. Um, however, theme-wise, he serves quite an important role. So we do want to spend some time talking about him. He is, I actually find him a, uh, well-deserved break, I guess. Mm. Um, and I think, you know what, he sets up Remus Lupin really well. That's true. He does. Um, because I think that, I think that also if we continuously had a new teacher every single year, that was evil. Uh, <laughs> and not just bad, like just not, not just bad at teaching like Gilderoy Lockhart is. If we had like another evil defense against the dark arts teacher, it would get real old real fast. You're probably uh, right. So, and so being able to sit there and be like, oh, this guy's just an idiot is actually kind of a refreshing twist that will then lead us to get a really good defense against the dark arts teacher and kind of sets us up for the future. Like not, not sure, like, like thinking that we can trust defense against the dark arts teachers again until we can't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> oh my God, Katie, thank you so much. Do you see this comment? I'm listening to this on a speaker at a salon and I'm not apologizing because these are some hot takes. Well, you ready for some Gilderoy Lockhart hot takes? Okay, oh. here's my first hot take. This comes directly from my notes that I took as I was reading. Hogwarts needs an HR department, okay? What <laughs> so are bad. they oh what God. are they doing? Okay, so like like imagine this. Imagine this in like a, a corporate setting or like a real school or whatever, right? And Severus Snape applies for this job it's implied like he's applied like at least five or six times like it's implied that it's like over and over and over and yet they keep giving the job to other people for some inexplicable reason like okay they need some kind of hr assistant or some kind of like administrative assistant or or, or some kind of admin somebody because that would be like an admin would in a real world in a real corporate setting an administrator would see that and be like dumbledore this person has applied for this job six times. You need to just give them a chance. Yeah. Like, if, if they had HR, Snape would been had this job. You know what I mean? And it's insane to me that they give it to Lockhart, who all he's ever done is, is just write stories. And, like, they just trust him and assume that everything in his books is real, which we know as writers, even when it comes to nonfiction, a lot of times those things are in there are not real. Um, you know, they're embellished or whatever. And and Dumbledore just gi just gives him the job when Snape is sitting there, had been applied for so many years. Like, just let him do a trial year, for fuck's sake. I don't know, Karen. I... I think I think Lockhart has some points. In fact, such good points that for my pretest, when I have my class this year, I will be making them uh, take a quiz on all about my likes and dislikes, including my favorite color. Mm -hmm. Well, but you also have to first make them watch um, a selection of the catalog of Interstage Window as yes. well as your poetry yes, book, yes, 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 yes. right? No, so they actually, have those are required this is, readings. This is required reading before the start of term. I've already sent right. out mm -hmm. the list. In fact, one of them's probably in the live now. Um, yeah, I believe it. <laughs> Even though this is an 18 plus stream. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what we want on this stream of sixth graders. No, it is uh, fucking ridiculous. Um, yeah, it's insane. I, I, yeah, it's still like, a part of me still wonders, like, and I know it's not this deep, right? I get it. But like, Dumbledore hiring Lockhart to either one of two ways, right? That J.K. Rowling is trying to convince us that Dumbledore is an idiot, or dumb, or trying to convince us that Dumbledore lets idiots teach his students. Maybe <laughs> this is why they made like um, Hermione get a little bit of an obsession with Lockhart to show that like smart people can be obsessed with stupid famous people too. I don't know. Maybe Dumbledore is like a Lockhart fanboy. Maybe that's what's going on here, and he just was blinded by the the star power of this man. I made that up right now. I have no idea. I'm just like I talking know. shit. I just this is so sad because all it did was like be like, oh, Hermione is in her like little girl feels, and it's like, oh my fucking god, stop. Uh, I mean, I get it, but also, <laughs> yeah, like I get it, but like stop. Um, no, I think um, I have no idea. I have no clue. 
I, uh, it makes me, it makes me inferior. It, I am infuriated at Lockhart and the fact that he's allowed to teach. I think mm-hmm. it was great choice writing style, like writing choice, but like, I'm just like, this is stupid. Hogwarts need to, needs an HR department. You are absolutely mm-hmm. right. <laughs> yep. And it's, it. and it's, the, the one thing I do enjoy about Lockhart though, is, is how he foreshadows himself, right? How basically he, he steals other people's stories and lies and pretends they're his story and writes them in the book. And then he memory charms them so that they can't tell. Right. And then at the end, of course, he is bested by his own memory charm. And I just, I just love that. Cause it's like, he's like this one trick pony character. All he can do is memory charms and, and he's very famous over lies that he didn't really accomplish, right? And then you've got Harry, our main character, who later we learn is a one-trick pony with Expelliarmus, who is famous for things that were totally outside of his control that he didn't really do. Like, he didn't do anything. He just happened to be in the right place at the right time when it comes to, you know, getting his scar and all of that stuff. And um, and I find that very interesting that both of these characters are very one-trick pony with their spells. Um, I don't know if there's any meaning there. I just think it's neat. I think I think it's a really interesting like yeah it's an interesting foreshadow. Um, it shows that I think that J.K.R. had some potential to be a good writer if this was purposeful. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that Harry and Lockhart do line up um, in in weird ways they do and in ways that they don't they're they don't either. But yeah, they're like a very they're like very like similarities and opposites a lot. Yeah, that one trick pony concept is a huge one the fact that yeah Lockhart is good at one thing and it's that one thing that takes him out is is a fascinating storytelling device Mm -hmm. um yeah I also think it's I also think that then we look at it larger outside of this book because like let's be honest we're not going to spend any more time talking about Gilderoy Lockhart outside of the second book so I think we also need to acknowledge what happens in the fifth book and that's that uh, we are we revisit Gilderoy Lockhart stuck in the hospital with no memories at all, the inability yeah. to retain memories, um, and having this idea that he is famous and only having the lies that he told as his as his history, only having like the the lies that he told us his only connection to history and the only people who know that are its lies are the people who who were there when he was charmed with this memory and mm-hmm. it's like this curse of of never really getting to know himself his punishment is that he will forever believe his own lies yeah, like it's very tragic it's very tragic and it's almost it's almost meant as a joke and as most tragic things are in children literature it's almost like given as a joke but it is this incredibly tragic thing that has happened to him that he is forever stuck with his own lies and never able to remember the fact that he himself is a fraud. Yeah, he doesn't uh, know. And only only very few people know. Like, I'm sure there's there's probably some outside of like Harry and the other kids that were there. Right. That know because um, there's no way he didn't make some mistakes along the way but it's still a very tiny number of people that know and it's just very sad like I imagine him in the hospital like regularly rereading his books to try to re- try to retain something or remember something of himself and he just can't well and it's like also this idea that he is like I could see and this might be the fan in so if I'm going too far you can shut me up but the idea that nurses are giving him these books to spark something and spark a memory and like maybe that's all he needs for his memory charm is something from before to come back to him but the reality is is that the things that he is reading never happened mm-hmm. so, the, so there's not gonna no work memory to spark yeah so that he is forever cursed to read these things he never did in search to to ignite some part of his memory and that they'll mm-hmm. never happen because he's not reading the right stuff because no one knows that he's a fake except for harry ron and hermione yeah, so sad. Yeah, Thanks Katie, awful. you're uh let me look at Katie's comment right here. Yes. Um having lived through that awful last president though, <laughs> we know that in real life a horrible self-centered narcissist can charm a large crowd into getting what he wants somehow. I'm just sad they wrote Hermione to fall for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think Gilderoy Lockhart is necessarily unrealistic. Like that's not my complaint with him. I just it, it's just not a trope I particularly enjoy. I find it boring. Um yeah. that's all that there really is to it. It's not I'm not saying that he's like a bad character or unrealistic or anything like that. It's just like it's not my interest yeah and I think that there's there's I totally agree that there's a lot of similarities with this but I also think it's pretty harsh to like do that comparison as far as like with with our last president um 
more so because Gilderoy is not cult like I think he's more celebrity like yeah. so it's it's like if Tom Cruise suddenly became your sixth grade teacher or yeah. not even Tom Cruise if Justin Bieber became somebody's sixth grade teacher that 12 year old would be like oh my god it's Justin Bieber sort of thing right yeah. like it, it would be like that that idea I think that if it was later and Hermione was older it would be even it would be almost out of character for that to happen yeah but and she's 12 at this point like she's so. 12 and Lockhart's blonde and has a smile and also Hermione totally like is that ADHD stereotypical like like child that lives off of praise and good grades and so he's calling her smart <laughs> and she's like oh my god anything to get this cute man to continue to call me smart so what like, you're I saying think- Landon is you would have absolutely fallen for it too at the age of 12. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I did no such thing. Leave me alone, okay? <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um. So, but well, there is one thing on the reread of this book that I found incredibly interesting in regards to Gilderoy Lockhart. Um, I I feel like this character and and the tragedy of him and what he goes through and and how his life has kind of um been laid out. It shows that at some point in time. J.K. Rowling understood the corrupting power of fame and how that getting famous was actually bad for people in a lot of ways and could really mess you up mentally and cause you to do things that you wouldn't normally do and cause you to push yourself farther and farther um, into some of your worst qualities. So like she knew this at one point in time. It's very obvious that she did because she would not have written Lockhart the way that she did. She wouldn't have been able to write him this way. Um, if she didn't know that that was something that happened to people. And I think that it is especially tragic that in reality, that's what's happening to JK Rowling now. And she'll say things like, I get all of these positive emails from my fans that still support me. And I just want to be like, Joanne, honey, those are not your fans. Those are turfs that are taking advantage of you. But because now she has kind of become Gilderoy Lockhart in a lot of ways, she doesn't see it that way. She can't, she can't see that, that outside world, right? That she used to be so in tune with because she used to understand what it was like to be, to be poor and to be um, downtrodden in your life, right? But that's, she's so far removed from that now. She doesn't see it. She just sees the praise and soaks it in. Yeah, I also think um, what is also tragic about this, obviously not having been in her mind when she wrote Chamber of Secrets, so maybe she didn't, but I always viewed Lockhart as a, as an extreme, like as a, almost to the point of it couldn't possibly happen version of fame, right? That this is a, this is like a cartoonish version. Uh, and I think J.K. Rowling like purposely did that, did ridiculous stuff with him, um, like would never let people take a test on him and his books, right? Like people wouldn't actually do that, right? But then J.K. Rowling is actually doing that. Like it mm-hmm. is scary to the point that she has become what I think she always thought was beyond possible, uh, if that makes sense. Absolutely. No, I think it definitely does. And it was something that like never really occurred to me. Because like I said, again, I usually skip this book in my reads. Yeah. So I, I only read it for the second time recently. And, and this, this, of course, was the first time that I have done anything Harry Potter since, um, you know, a couple of years ago when the manifesto came out, and I just was so done and angry. Um, so rereading it, you know, post that it was very enlightening to see that at one point in time, like, she kind of got it. She kind of got that fame wasn't a good thing. It was it was a bad thing. And that for some people, it's like an absolutely terrible thing. Like it totally destroys Gilderoy Lockhart. I think there's also something interesting about um, about that and the in the parallel to power that we discussed in the previous book. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea of Slytherins and their want to be on top and everything like that. Like the ambition is bad. The ambition is bad. And that fame and ambition have a lot to do with each other, which is also why I resent Gilderoy Lockhart not being in Slytherin. Not that we need another example of bad Slytherin, but like Gilderoy Lockhart is the most ambitious person other than Horace Slughorn that we meet. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the idea that he's not in Slytherin is funny. And he only knows one spell. So (laughs) why he's in Ravenclaw, who knows? But um, 
I, I, I think that it's also very fascinating that they are so linked so early in these books. Um, and as we, as Harry gets more famous and as Joanne gets more famous, we definitely lose this. We definitely lose this perspective. Yeah. Um, and, and there's almost more like sympathetic, like sympathetic ideals that come with the people who are in power and who do have fame. And like we, and, and it's part of Harry's story, but we are made to feel sorry for Harry because of his fame, right? And, and it is because the press is terrible within these books. But I think it's just a very interesting shift that as Harry gets more famous, so does Joanne. And mm -hmm. the, the perspective of that fame, it's not a sudden shift of 23 years later, uh, J.K. Rowling has become Gilderoy Lockhart. We see that progression through her. Yep, yep. And, and if you're, watch. yeah, and if you're interested in us talking more about that, um, week after next, so not next week, but the week after that, we're going to do our follow up um, fandom episode to this book, and we are going to talk all about um, the the way that J.K. Rowling changed throughout the books after the books. Um, you know, as Pottermore launched, as she got more popular on tr Twitter. So um, we're going to talk about kind of the, the timeline of her fame and how that affected us as fans and um, and how that affected the, the franchise of Harry Potter. So if you're interested to hear more about some of this type of stuff, uh, please tune in week after next where we go all through um, the timeline of the rise and fall of J.K. Rowling. Yeah, it'll be really interesting. Uh, the famous yes. follies of J.K. Rowling instead of Gilderoy Lockhart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And one other fun thing, I think, in regards to this, just this is just like a nice little symbolism thing that I really like in this book. I like that this book, the theme is all about fame. And then the main monster of it is a big snake, you know, the, the snake you, of temptation. I think that's really neat. You pointed this out and I was blown away. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, I just figured snake Slytherin, right? Um, but well, that like, probably was the intention, but I don't care about what the intention was. I think it's neat. <laughs> it's so neat. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Good symbolism there. Yeah. Well, have, have Snake be the monster in your book about fame. <laughs> well, speaking of monsters. Yes. Let's talk about our monster in this one. <laughs> uh, oh, did it skip it? It skipped the thing. Uh oh. Well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> the uh, keeper of incredibly dangerous uh, animals of Hogwarts, Rubeus Hagrid. <laughs> yes. So this this is one of the books where we get quite a lot of Hagrid time. So we wanted to take a moment to talk about him as a character and what he means to the series because he's hugely important in Harry's life and hugely influential on the series. Like a lot of the themes of Harry Potter as a series are told through Rubeus Hagrid, right? Um, so, for example, he is continuously found guilty of things he didn't do, right? This happened when he was a child in in Hogwarts. Like, he was found guilty of that whole situation. He, he got expelled. He uh, got his magic taken away from him, told, like, he's not allowed to do magic for, for opening the Chamber of Secrets, which he didn't do. He didn't do that. And, and I think that there's this level of the people in that time knew that he didn't do it because they let him stay at Hogwarts. Yeah. Like they, I mean, Dumbledore like, obviously if, knew. Yeah. If there is this T, if there is this student that is dangerous enough that they have killed another student or have at least housed a monster that killed another student was able to open the chamber of secrets and killed another student, you wouldn't just be like, you know what you're expelled from school we're gonna stop your wand but you can stay on the premises of the of the castle live here and work here doesn't like make that, any sense that doesn't make any sense which means at the very least Dumbledore knew uh Dipwit who is I think that's his name yeah uh, something like that you're close if it's not that uh who is the who was the uh the headmaster before the headmaster <laughs> Dumbledore the yeah um it knew at the very, very least, knew that he was not guilty of the crime mm -hmm. that he was being that he was being expelled for. Yeah, and um, it's, it's just awful. Like it really shows that like the entire um, justice system in the wizarding world is like totally jacked up. Um, you know, much like real life. 
<laughs> um, I don't know exactly what the justice system is like in the UK. I imagine it's similarly awful as it is in the US because we both use common law. Like we learned it from, from the UK. Like the reason our a lot of our legal system is set up the way it is is because we learned it from the UK. Um, so I, I assume that's still true in, in a modern sense. So it's really jacked up. And this is one of those ways, like basically Hagrid, the way that, the way that I understand it is he's a minor, so he's not like tried or anything, but he is punished appropriately for, um, for his age, for doing something awful. And yet he's allowed to stay. It makes, it makes no sense. Like why punish him in the first place if the people in power don't really believe he did it? Obviously there's some kind of messed up um, system going on there. Well, also I think the system is messed up in general because the proper punishment is snapping a wizard's wand, which is cutting them off from their culture. Like that in itself is, is terrible. The idea of the expulsion means that you can never do magic. Like yeah, that, and it, it's, it's awful and we never really learn how Hogwarts works in that way like mm -hmm. like we've always been told that you have to be of age to do magic but do you have to have like a license to do magic because it kind of not, implies that you do it kind of implies that you have to have graduated at least some kind of accredited school to do magic but we are never like it's just this really interesting like I think it's a big plot hole where there's we're never really told because like fifth like okay Hagrid was in his fifth year so did he have to complete his OWLs in order to get licensure of doing certain kinds of magic or is it all magic who fucking knows right we don't know it's just it's just this crazy it's this crazy system that's never explained and that's fine she doesn't have to explain every system to us uh no but that's what fandom sudden, is for <laughs> <laughs> but all of a sudden Hagrid who is found guilty of a crime that he did not commit uh, again he's just taken in a, yeah he was just taken in a spider uh and that spider hasn't hurt anybody is now being expelled from the only place that he calls and considers home um yeah. the only place that he has a home and and people know that he didn't do it mm -hmm. yeah. so i guess the big question is why was he found guilty yeah uh, hmm. and there's like really really big problem here and that's the fact that hagrid is large Mm -hmm. And Hagrid being large is due to the fact that his mother is a half giant. Yeah. So or his mother he, is a giant. His, he's yeah. a half giant. Uh, so this is pure racism. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's obvious that's what's going because on here. There really isn't, there really isn't any other thing that would explain it. Um, it's never said, of course, because from Harry's perspective, he doesn't necessarily realize this is what's happening. But it, it, there's, give me a better explanation. I don't think you can. Um, he's, this happens because... Uh, Hagrid is a half giant, so he's a very easy scapegoat. Plus, he's a little bit weird. He likes animals better than people. So not only is he different in appearance and in and in culture and in ethnicity, he his like his just his behavior is just weird on top of that. So it's very easy to be like that one. You will scapegoat. And I yeah. think it's it's and then and then this happens again to him, right? Like this happens like again to him in the books. So so fifty years where nothing ever happens. Hagrid lives on the grounds, works on the grounds. He lives and breathes Hogwarts. He yep. runs personal errands for Albus Dumbledore. He is a, a right-hand man of Albus Dumbledore and he has his ear and he believes he knows what's good. And yes, he's broken a few rules like bringing in a dragon, but you know, it's fine, right? Well, um, you tell me, you work at a place for 50 years and never, ever break a rule. Like, try. It's very yeah, hard, actually. Yeah, right? <laughs> it is fine. No one died. 50 years She's not perfect, died. okay? <laughs> and then, without a trial, without reasoning, for something, by the way, he was not found guilty of in a court of law in Wizarding World, as far as we have been known. Mm -hmm. I would assume because you can't necessarily hire ex-cons. Uh, to work at schools so I would assume that he was never found guilty in the court of law in the wizarding world who the knows ministry decides to come in 50 years after no in after no incident and arrest him yeah I mean and Cornelius and Fudge all but says I get it Hagrid but we need a scapegoat like he might as well have just said that yeah sends him to Azkaban 
for no reason. Also, the fact that there is no in between between being free and being yeah. Okay, can I oh, can I talk about that for a minute? Yeah, so ahead. in this book, we don't know we don't really know what Azkaban is in this book. But later we learn that Azkaban is basically wizarding supermax. Okay, this is where you put you know like your child molesters and your serial killers and you know and and your Nazis. This is where you put your Nazis in Azkaban, right? And H Hagrid has to go spend time in Azkaban. Like, where's the Wizarding World jail? Where's the Wizarding World drunk tank? Where's like, where's like the Wizarding World, you know, house arrest situation? Like, what? They don't ha like, this makes no sense to me. And I don't, I, obviously it's fantasy, right? So like, I'm not trying to be too hard on this, but it's one of those things that's and kind it's of just like, novel yeah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And when she did this, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Azkaban probably wasn't planned to be Wizarding Supermax at this time. You know, it was just like a fun word to throw oh, in she... there to name the prison. Although she doubled downs on it when Hagrid talks about it in the next book, being like, right, yes, that really uh, anyway. Happened. <laughs> it's just so, and it just blows my mind. It blows my mind because like, if this was real, if this was real life, if this was like anything like that, Hagrid wouldn't be going to any sort of prison. He would go to like a holding cell in a jail or he would be put on some kind of house arrest, you know, and monitored. Like that's what, that's what would happen. Like sending him to Azkaban makes no sense. Like the wizarding world is harsh. Like it is harsh. Like, oh my God. It's like Harry went, it took, went out of the frying pan and into the fire. Like this world is no better than what he came from. But let me tell you, because this man is a half giant and viewed as dangerous and possibly tying because he's in the same place at the same time, he murdered, he murdered people. That's what they've decided. Right. And like, uh, I mean, Harry also murdered people because Draco thinks he did. Right. And yes. then and Draco definitely murdered people because Harry thinks he did. I mean, and we you also, know. And we also are aware that this is being pushed by the Board of Governors, which yeah. has Lucius Malfoy on it, mm -hmm. which we have been told and at this point and, and will later learn is a Nazi. Uh, because he did follow Voldemort. <laughs> uh, yes, he, he is a, I guess you would call it a um, magic supremacist or something he's like a that. Magic supremacist uh, who does not believe in, in half beings and does not think that they deserve to live. Mm -hmm. uh, and he is the one pursuing and pressuring uh, the school to fire Dumbledore and to get rid of Rubius Hagrid. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we do know that this is not just Cornelius Fudge, although an interesting thing that the school board controls the Ministry of Magic. Uh, but you know what? It's a children's novel, so we can let some of those stuff go. They also only have one <laughs> school in that, that's supposed to service the entire UK English speaking wizarding world um in in Europe so you know I mean obviously and it's a very it's a very small town it is a very small town these magic people <laughs> and to be honest I'm so bored at the book at this time that the only reason I'm angry is because that's the emotion it's making me feel because I'm so bored uh <laughs> there's nothing else there's nothing else so yeah, um, it's just it's just very it, when it comes to Hagrid, um, it's one of those things that's kind of like I I just I I wish there was a little bit more care taken into introspection in these books because I do think there is an interesting reflection on there of like why Hagrid. Yeah, I also think it it's really telling that um, Joanne doesn't consider Hagrid anything more in Harry's life, and I. Th than, than just a person to be there sometimes. Uh, and I do think that this is a JKR choice and not a Harry being a true, like not a Harry choice. Like the mm. fact that, that it is, a lot of the times Harry's thought process is and Hagrid uh, when being reminded. Mm. Um, that that he, he isn't automatically going to Hagrid, even though Hagrid has done everything he can to take care of Harry, to it, introduce him into this world. He's the person who took him out of it in the set in the first the very beginning of the first book who has brought him back in it in saves his ass in this book too when he accidentally ends um, up in nocturne alley yeah saves his ass in this one um saves his ass with this doesn't really save his ass with the spiders but but haggard is an vitally important character in harry's life and mm -hmm. harry doesn't treat him that way and really. i don't think that's a harry decision because that doesn't make any sense with an in character with harry i think that's the jkr decision um, I'm not sure. I mean, we do know that we do know that Harry is a bad friend. 
<laughs> I don't think Hagrid, Hagrid's an adult. I don't yeah. think Harry would see Hagrid as a friend. I don't think he would either. Uh, I think, especially because this is Harry. So any yeah. man who is above the age of eighteen that pays any attention to Harry is automatically a father figure. Like, it's true. <laughs> like, like Harry, Hagrid, Harry has an Harry has an irreverence for Dumbledore, even though they've not had that many interactions. In the next book, we're going to see um, his irreverence for yes. um, for Sirius Black, right? And or no, is that the fourth Lupin. book? Nope, both of them. Uh, no, a yeah. The... For, a little bit for uh, Sirius Black, a lot of it for Remus Lupin. A, a lot, lot of it for, for Lupin. Uh, we see a little bit with Arthur Weasley, and we'll continue mm-hmm. to see a little bit with Arthur Weasley. It will only grow for Dumbledore. Uh, Alastair Moody comes in, and there's almost a relationship there. Hagrid oh, yeah. Is the adult male in Harry's life that Harry has no relation to, and the fact that he is a half-giant I think says a lot. Like the, just, I think it's it, really interesting. It's really it's interesting, interesting because, and it, and I, I can't help but wonder if that's not if that's a thing, right? Yeah, it's it is interesting because Harry ha- doesn't have any kind of um, frame of reference for um, discrimination and discrimination against um, half people, right? So like half giants or half whatever. Um, so he doesn't have any frame of reference for that. And yet, uh, I think you could make a case that he, you know, feels discriminatory, uh, towards Hagrid. Well, and also how Hagrid is, his character in general, very dumb, very, um, you know, kind of half there, half, like, hate to say it, but half wit almost. Mm -hmm. Um, like there's, there's a lot of similarities there that is just, it's very interesting. It's very interesting that the relationship there. Hagrid, mm-hmm. I don't think, gets the recognition that is deserved of him throughout the series. Um, by like by Fanon, even, uh, to sit there and be like, Hagrid is an amazing character. Yeah. And the fact that like this shit happens and then no one pays him any mind is so sad. <laughs> it's really sad because I, I feel like um Hagrid helps Harry uh more in some ways or just as much i think you could make the argument either way because it's pretty close um as dumbledore as far as giving him clues to what he needs to solve the problems as far as being there for him um and making sure that he's safe well as as safe as he possibly can as the protagonist of a fiction book so (laughs) I i also think that it is incredibly important too that um there are very different reasons why hagrid does it versus dumbledore dumbledore we know because of how the seventh book happens, that this is all self-serving. Dumbledore yeah. sees Harry, he cares her- about Harry, but but Harry is a means to an end to Dumbledore. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he needs Harry to be at a certain place so that Harry is willing to kill himself in order to finally kill Voldemort. Um, and, and so like everything Dumbledore does kind of helps him toward that goal and end Hagrid just wants Harry to be alive and happy yeah like for for Hagrid's perspective he's given this task to go get Harry by Dumbledore Harry is this this very famous kid who has not had the best childhood um Hagrid's first interaction with him is is figuring finding out that Harry knows nothing of his culture and and Hagrid is incredibly offended by that like he thinks that is tragic and so the bond that Hagrid forms with Harry is um is far more pure. Like uh, Katie said, when we first started talking about Hagrid um, and so pure sold, like, yeah, like his intentions are pure. He's always trying his best, even though he screws up a lot of times. He always is legitimately trying. He always is legitimately trying. He doesn't have any kind of underhanded anything. No, it is. It's very good. And Hagrid does not get enough uh, recognition for the, for, for the good goodness that he is and who he brings. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think I think because he's not quite as he's not super smart and I think that um for a lot of people it's easy to dismiss him because of that um but rereading it as as an adult it's uh I, I find a lot more care for him because you kind of realize that like you know a lot of people turn out not to be that smart and that doesn't yeah. mean that they don't have good contributions and they aren't good at certain things and I also think rereading this book we genuinely oh one of my lights is on sorry I just realized something um we genuinely uh do not see people care about Harry for just caring about Harry. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like every adult you can go through cares about Harry for one way or another. And it's not because they just want Harry to be okay. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think Hagrid is the only character, the only adult character that truly does that, that doesn't yep. want something else from Harry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I think you're uh, right. I can't really think of another one that does. The only other characters I can Remus, think of that do are, are kids, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's an argument to be said about Remus Lupin. Yeah, but I think um, all, but of, and then, all of the Marauders, all of the Marauders really suffer from looking at looking at him and seeing James. And I think Remus yeah. does too. Uh, I think to an extent, certainly less than serious, but I, yeah. I do. But it still happens. It still happens. It still happens. Um, Molly Weasley really just wants to fix Harry. Uh, everyone, I think everyone else doesn't look at Harry and see Harry as he is. They they want something from Harry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, underrated character. Absolutely. All right. All right. <laughs> Don't play my favorite game of this of this of this uh, particular thing. Yes. We will continue to play throughout all of the rest of the books. And if we continue to do Fantastic Beasts, we'll play it then too. And that's called Spot the Problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so we're going to kind of rapid fire through a couple of things that are um, that are interesting in this book that are very, that are problematic. And, um, and you can kind of, you can kind of decide for yourself whether they're problematic in like an interesting fictional way or they're problematic in a like, oh my God, I can't believe she did that way. Um, but yeah, yeah, here we go. So, um, Chamber of Secrets, spot the problematic. <laughs> uh, the first one is the ugliness of villains. Is it a children's <laughs> book trope or fat phobia? Uh, and of course, it doesn't just have to do with fat phobia. Although in this particular book, that is where it's seen most. All of the cruel and unkind characters to Harry are described as some sort of ugly. We have uh, Vernon Dursley and uh, and Dudley Dursley, who are both fat. We have uh, Petunia Dursley, who looks like squinched and, and rat-like, I think is how they described her, uh, which is a lot. Uh, we have Snape, who is greasy and hook-nosed. Uh, Draco Malfoy, who will re- be referred to, not in this one, but will continuously be referred to as Ferret. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... he's very he's, he's, he gets a lot of like rodent descriptions yeah. um poor tom uh, he does not look like a rodent and is actually a, a gorgeous human being but you know in the books <laughs> uh melissa bolstrode who is again described as fat and ugly um and crab and goyle we have fat mm-hmm. of course large and fat. i think does it does petunia get a, a mention in this book i know she's described as uh large and ugly as well i'm pretty sure mm-hmm. Um, I, no, not Petunia. What's the, uh, uh, the other Slytherin girl? Uh, Her no. Oh, me. Pansy Parkinson. Yeah, Pansy With Parkinson. Pug face. Pug, pug face. Pug, oh, yeah, pug face. That's hers. Pug faced. Um, yeah. So all of the, all of the bad guys, for the most part, um, and this is a trend that has happened in every Harry Potter book, so we will continue to spot out these problems. Um, but in the, those are the ones that happened directly in this book mm-hmm. are uh, described as ugly. Yeah. The only hot villain we ever get is young Tom Riddle. I can't. And- I don't think there's any in this book. We get young Tom Riddle, um, and, uh, and, and that's the only one. And Lucius Malfoy, I don't think, has... Uh, but he doesn't get described. I don't think Lucius Malfoy's appearance gets described. He doesn't. Uh, so that's how we know he's hot, is J.K. Rowling. <laughs> like, let's talk about the fact that uh, Tom Riddle is hot, but that's pre-body horror. Like, yep. there's there's a lot of stuff that he does to his own body that makes Voldemort ugly later. Yeah. So wickedness makes you ugly. It's not just being a witch that makes you ugly. It's being mm-hmm. evil that makes you ugly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I do, and I think there's an argument to be made for like, oh, it's a children's book trope. But at the same time, the fact that J.K. Rowling leans so heavily into like fatness as a descriptor for ugliness, um, I think really betrays her fat phobia. Yeah, it's that's. The, I mean, it's fine if you. I get it. Like Snape shouldn't be an attractive guy, in my opinion. Like I mean, just, yeah, I dis- agree to uh, disagree. <laughs> I mean, you can have that opinion. <laughs> you can find Alan Rickman attractive, but Snape the character should not be described as attractive. My heart. Uh, however, but however, the fact that out of the six characters I mentioned, four of them are fat. Mm-hmm. And that's their descriptor. Like it's not fat in something else. It's fat. Mm-hmm. Yep. That that's it. So this continues yeah. to happen. It happened in the first book. It happened in this happens in the second book. It happens. I'm pretty sure in every single book. It happens at least once, if not multiple times. 
fine. Uh, yep. It just get more and more wild and yep. fatter and fatter. So um, next, next though. Go. Oh, that's oh. the other. Oh no, it's fine. I'll no, you go, go, go. I was gonna say. Oh. When Dudley starts getting a personality. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll talk about that in the fifth book. We'll come back. We'll we'll circle back to that on Dudley. Back to that. All right. The next uh, one: casual uh, casual slavery. Casual slavery. Me. My um my my favorite problematic Molly quote is when she she uh she somberly uh, laments, wishing that she could have had her very own slave. I just can you imagine being like, yes, we have this world. Everything is magical. You can make everything happen if you want. But also there's an entire race of creatures that are dedicated to serving hand and foot, Harry, uh, serving hand and foot witches and wizards. And it's an honor to own them. And they love it. I can't. I can't. Oh, and it's not problematic at all. We're just going to continue, like, not even, like, skim over this. We're just going to, it just exists and people accept it. And not yeah. only accept it, they want it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're going to um, talk about this more, of course, when Spew comes into the books, because um, yeah, because J.K. Rowling does try to like address the what the fuck nature of um, the way that house elves are portrayed in this book and in the next book. So we'll get into that more then. But uh, but it starts here. It starts here. And and the Molly saying she wishes she had a house elf is where, to me, it's just like a beacon of, oh my God, the wizarding world is like kind of an awful place. Um, it's not awesome and magical. Oh. <laughs> it's really jacked. <laughs> it's just, the, it's the casualness of slavery. Like, fine. Yeah. If you want to just full full embrace slavery, cool, good for you. That's your world, right? You get to write those problems, but it's the casually dropping it and then pretending everyone's okay with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and then not and then people not thinking it's an issue for two more years until you started getting criticisms in the books. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> next one for spot the problem is girls' bathrooms. Terribly dark things happen if you let boys in. Uh, like holly juice potions. <laughs> like holly juice potions and murder. Uh, <laughs> like the fact that Moaning Myrtle was murdered in a bathroom. And we know that JKR is really sensitive about her girls' bathrooms. Mm -hmm. and just like this was before the turf stuff. It, but it just, there's a little, just a little thing about it. Yeah, and we'll talk a lot more about this when it come, when Rita Skeeter is um is introduced. But it's interesting that you can kind of see like echoes of it in this book before we even get to that. Before we even get to the full on like wait what? There's like little echoes of it in this book where they spend so much time in the girls' bathroom doing things that they're not supposed to be doing, right? Um, where uh where poor moaning Myrtle uh is is murdered, right? Like. And it's, it's implied that it's just this one specific girl's bathroom, but I just think it's really interesting that the setting chosen is a girl's bathroom. Well, then, and then the Chamber of Secrets is a girl's bathroom, the heiress of the room is a male. Like, it's just this really interesting, it's an interesting choice. Yeah. Uh, and that might have nothing to do with uh, what is later part of the argument, but it's certainly ironic. Mm-hmm. Interesting. It's just interesting <laughs> upon reflection. Fascinating. It's just like, huh. Who knew? Always <laughs> protective about those girl ba girls' bathrooms, huh? <laughs> um, Boys, don't go in girls' bathrooms. Horrible things will befall you. You will you will end up in all kinds of trouble. Just stay out. We're doing crazy rituals in there. <laughs> or, you, or you won't. Like, that's the other thing, too. Or you won't get in trouble because none of them did. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. None of them did, even though they, they spent, like, months uh, hiding this polyjuice potion. Yeah, this one bathroom is not used because there's this one crying ghost. It's just such a... It, there, that's a kid's book thing right there, right? Yeah, and no one ever goes yeah. in to clean it in all these months. Like, even if a bathroom's not being used, you still have to clean it every so often. Yeah. Also, like... Did none of us go to middle school? Like, I feel like a crying girl happened in most bathrooms in middle school. Yeah, it didn't keep people out. You just you went in and peed and then left. Part of the polite thing to do was ignore the fact that someone was sobbing in the stall next to you. Like, right? that's just middle school. <laughs> uh, and also, it's workers' go girl code here, too. It's like, ah, needed a good cry. I understand. Um, <laughs> it just happens sometimes. <laughs> All right, last one. Yep, the casual racism. We talked about this um, in regards to Hagrid just a moment ago, of course, but 
It's just really interesting that um, that the way that this is portrayed is is very like, okay, well, this just happens and the subtext is really obvious, but absolutely no one's going to say the R word, um, you know, or remark on it. Like not even Hagrid himself is going to have a fleeting thought of this feels kind of racist, you know, um, it's just sort of, it's just a thing that happens and this is part of the world and um, we just can't imagine a world without this, you know. And it, it's nice that it's nice at this point that we can say casual racism because, you know, starting next book, it's not going to be so casual. Yeah. Uh, so right now we're just enjoying the casual racism. <laughs> yep. It's just interesting. It's interesting to me because these books are about bigotry, right? Of course, about, you know, m magical um, pure bloods versus magical, you know, people that aren't necessarily pure blood. But it's interesting the way that the racism manifests in other areas that aren't necessarily your blood status. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, believe it or not, that takes us to our final thoughts. Oh my God, Karen, we might finish on time. <gasps> wow we're at final thoughts right at the 15 minute mark that's what we wanted y'all maybe we finally figured out how to do these live video essays in our two hour time frame um no, it took a few tries this is the most, this is the most boring book so. this, it took a few tries but we figured it out landon God, when just... we get to, oh okay i'm not celebrating until we get to book five and see if we can make that into two hours Oh God, please pray for us. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, there's probably going to be things that we want to talk about and don't. But anyways, yes, final thoughts. Okay, so this book, um, it's it's still children's lit. And, I, and because we already know the world, we've been introduced to it. I don't find it nearly as magical as the first book. I don't find the ending gives me as much of a feeling of verisimilitude as the ending of the first book because we don't really care about Jenny, right? So I don't get that, oh yeah, of course, they're, like at the end of the first book, it's like, oh, there's a trial for each of the each of the three of them. And oh, that's so cool. And oh, it's really Voldemort. Oh, this is so awesome. You know, I don't get that. And that surprised good... that it was Coral and not Snape. Yeah, and, yeah. I, don't, I don't get that, like that good, good, like verisimilitude, like, oh, it all fits together so nicely feeling in this book, um, mostly because there's not a lot of fun new stuff about the world. I mean, I love the death day party. There's a few new fun things about the world, but you don't get nearly as much. Um, and then the ending, because I don't have feelings about Jenny at this point, I don't get like that, ooh, that feels so good at the end that I got at the end of the first book. So this is, um, it's still just, it's just not very good compared to the rest of the series. And that's still how I feel about it. Um, I, I found a lot of interesting things about Lockhart in there that uh, that I didn't get before because, of course, all of this Twitter drama had not happened before. Um, so, you know, that kept me interested. But overall, this still is the worst installment in a, in a very good series. But the worst installment of a good series, it still means something. So that's my final thoughts. Landon, what are your final thoughts? This book is boring. Um, it, as a fiction, as someone who who devours fiction and likes to read children's books, uh, this book is really hard to get into. It's really hard to connect with. Uh, I don't skip it on my on my reads. However, it is my dreaded book, and I find myself skimming it more than anything else. Um, I don't particularly find I enjoy this book. I do, however, enjoy discussing this book because I think that there's a lot of things that happen in this book as an adult we can now see as like interesting. Like I really did enjoy being able to build this essay and, and these points on, you know, fame and J.K. Rowling's experiences in it. Uh, so as, as someone who is, who is maybe taking it apart it's a little bit more interesting, but actually reading it and trying to get to the core of it, it's really tough. Uh, I think that there's a lot of reluctance in, you can feel the reluctance in J.K. Rowling's writing. She doesn't want to be writing kids books. Um, and that's what she's kind of been forced into. And mm -hmm. I feel like there, and because of that, it's lost its magic. 
Um, there are ways to world build, but she didn't, she couldn't because she had written herself kind of in a corner and, uh, and, and the, the little bit of world building we got wasn't nearly enough what it, what it could have been, yeah. uh, or, or where it could have fit. So I, I honestly think that this is probably the, my least, it is my least favorite book to read. It's one of my least favorite movies to watch. And it was probably J.K. Rowling's least favorite book to write. <laughs> I suspect it was too. I mean, I think you're right. She she um, she feels she at this point she's probably feeling like, gosh, I can't believe the children's book I wrote is the one that got popular out of everything I wrote. It's not really my preferred genre. Oh no, what am I going to do? You yeah. know. And she said that in interviews before that like children's lit was not really what her passion or dream was. So um, I can totally see uh, the in the writing in this book that being the subtext yep um and i think that it's also clinging on because it's clinging on to children's books it's also clinging on to a level of uh, whimsy is the right word i think um that is lost after this book which is mm -hmm. good because i think that whimsy it's the same thing that made you know that that had her have dumbledore say funny words at the beginning of each speech uh, that had her have a Hogwarts song. It's like that idea of keeping it young and silly. Uh, this is the last grasp onto it. And then after that, it she's able to let it go. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciate this as a good transition, as a good goodbye to Children's Lit. Uh, I appreciate and think it's necessary for the series. I think it sets up a lot of interesting characters, a lot of development. I think the themes are vastly important and things that we will continue to see throughout the rest of the series. However, this book is fucking boring. Yep, that's the truth. So ready for moving on to way more interesting things. So the way, so to give you guys um, a little sneak peek of what's coming for the future media episodes, we can go ahead and go to that slide, it's fine. Um, for future media episodes, basically what's going to happen is in September, our episode is going to be about um, some Disney movies. We are going to watch the original animated Mulan, the Disney version, and then we're also going to watch the Disney live action remake, and we're going to be talking about those two versions, um, what, uh, what, how they compare to each other, uh, and kind of the the interesting connection between those, and uh, and of course the original. Uh, folktale ballad of Mulan. Um, but before we get to that, because that's a month away, of course, we have a lot of other fun things that we're planning for you for our stream. So next week, we're actually going to be having our community day. We're going to be going Stardew Valley again. So we're probably going to end up finishing out spring in Stardew Valley. So if you're interested in farming with us, uh, come join us next week for some more Stardew Valley. I think, Landon, you're finally going to be able to play this time, right? You're not busy? <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am, I don't know. I, I might be an episode of Where in the World is Landon, but I will be here. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we'll so see. It's not stream, but it might be a different background. Who knows? My summer is almost over. This is not going to happen as much. <laughs> yes. Landon um, decided to, be, because of her profession, of course, she had to pack all of her summer into like just a few weeks and all of her trips for the year. Because obviously once school starts, those do not happen. They do not. <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> well, one may, but the other, but nothing else will after that. Yes. <laughs> um, also, very quick, just want to like put this out there. You should come be excited, rewatch the movies for Mulan if you watch them. It is going to be a really fucking fun discussion. Uh, and we got some stuff planned. So make sure you mark your calendars. It's the first week in September for that one. So it's yep, going to be so a that's lot of the, fun. the fourth, right? September 4th. Yes. 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 All um, right. Yes. Yep. So that's going to be super fun. Um, also, on the next Thursday stream, I'm going to be doing a first impressions of a game called Boyfriend Dungeon. I know nothing about this game other than reading the description, and the description of it is you go and you fight monsters in a dungeon with your weapon, who also can transform into your boyfriend. So as you go on dates with your boyfriend, your weapon gets stronger and, and things of that nature. That's kind of what I'm expecting of this game. Um, but when I read the description, I was like, this is perfect. This is beautiful. Um, I'm not going to lie. In particular, I had Kendra in mind. I'm like, I have to stream this game. So that's next <laughs> Thursday. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, uh, there's all the different ways that you can find me. So I'll pop my socials in the chat. 
Um, I do things like most content creators do. You know, I have a YouTube, uh, and y'all know I have spare room on there. I also post the VODs of my streams on there. Um, I have Twitter is the main social media that I use. Of course, I have a Patreon, da da da, da. I mean, you guys know how this works. I do everything like every other content creator. Um, so that's where you can find me. And uh, Landon, where can everybody find you? Uh, first, before I shout out where everyone else can find me, I don't know if she's still here. She popped in for a minute and if she still has this on the loudspeaker at the salon, but I just really wanted to say thank you to Katie. Uh, I talked to her in her DMs earlier, but she provided uh, a lot of books for my classroom. And so I just wanted to give her a shout out on screen on stream because it is awesome and amazing. So thank you, Katie, so much. Uh, yes, I, big I, thank I, you. Uh, Landon's class next year is going to be really appreciative of this. I am going to force them to read all of the books. Like, <laughs> like no, read this one. You have, you have to read this one. Uh, so, yes. Anyway, my socials are in the chat. You can go ahead and follow me on Instagram, on TikTok, uh, on anything like that. Uh, also, Twitter, I make hot takes. And right now I'm watching The Walking Dead, uh, which has been a really interesting thing. My ADHD is crazy at the moment. <laughs> So uh, sometimes I remember their names, sometimes I don't. Uh, and I have a big old crush on Megan, who is not in the series yet. So that's what we're waiting for. Oh, you got a while for him. Oh, yeah. No, I'm. it's going to be a while, but it's fine. I'm rewatching it. So I know everything that's happening. Uh, <laughs> it's more like, I don't remember whose character, what name, like Rick Diggins or whatever his name is. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Rick. Um, <gasps> it's really entertaining. So come watch me on Twitter as I lose my mind yay and that's what you got for me so thank you guys so much for listening to us ramble about harry potter and the chamber of secrets yes oh my god this was a, such a fun one i'm looking now for somebody that we can raid into it doesn't look like any of my friends are online i'm trying to see if anybody um from the from elixir is online it doesn't look like it it looks like oh wait haha -ha! That Boyfriend Dungeon game that I'm going to stream on Thursday, it looks like Dunny is about to start streaming it. So um, if y'all want a, a, a somebody else's opinion on that game too, I'll give mine on Thursday when I do my first impressions. I'm not going to watch this. I'm just going to raid into it for you guys. It looks like um, Dunny is doing that. Let me open up his stream right now, make sure it's live. And we will raid into that. Oh no. He's not actually quite live yet. Oh uh, no. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see if I can find somebody. Time. Sorry? <laughs> this is what we get for ending on time. I know. We end on time and then nobody's live. I want to see if anybody's ta doing any kind of Harry Potter anything. Um, it looks like there is this channel called Potterthon where they're maybe doing the Harry Potter games. It says called Potterthon 7. Um, oh, and, and they have a donation to the Trevor Project right down no. in their description. Okay, that's, this is who we're rating. This is, um, this, I think the channel is just called Potterthon. Cool. I'm gonna have to follow them. Okay, here we go. All right, y'all have fun with that. I will see you on Thursday or next week. Um, thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. Bye guys. All right, bye all.